Shanxi province is right in the heart of the Lus Plateau, and Ho Jia Go is typical of remote villages there. Life here, for as long as anyone can remember, has been one of suffering and poverty. Liu Dongfu's life has often reflected that suffering. When Liu was young, his family fled famine in the north to settle in Ho Jia Go. His father hoped that food would be more plentiful in this remote place. Within a few years after the family arrived, his mother and his little brother both died. When Zhang Fang married into the village as a young bride, she first lived in a traditional cave dwelling. Every day, Zhang Fang had to work in the fields from early in the morning till late at night. And then she still had to care for the animals and look after her children. The early 1960s in the Lus Plateau was a desperate time. Millions suffered. Li Shofu's family also came to the area in the hopes of a better life. Year after year, floods and droughts destroyed the crops and with them the Lee family's hopes. Exactly what causes a place that was once bountiful to become so degraded? What has happened here is that originally you had a complete vegetation cover with a fully intact hydrocycle. All the rainfall that fell down stayed where it was initially. It slowly infiltrated into the ground, was absorbed by the root system, went into the groundwater and eventually drained into the Yellow River over a long period of time, hundreds of days between a rainfall event and by the time the water ended up in the Yellow River. As the vegetation cover was removed gradually, the runoff increased dramatically every century, every decade, to the point where now when it rains, 95% of the water immediately is lost to the, to the environment where it's, where it's coming down. Immediately it runs off in a gully, takes a lot of the topsoil with it and ends up in the Yellow River. So you have a situation where literally 95% of the water is gone. And this is the reason why this area is so dry, why the rainfall has been decreased, why the vegetation cover can hardly be sustained right now because everything is so dried up. These are the conditions in which huge dust storms form, affecting vast areas 
as these satellite images show. The consequences of this are felt by everyone. The storms cause disruptions for cities like Beijing and contribute to climate change by allowing sunlight to penetrate but trapping the heat. There is also massive impact to the river system downstream. On average, 1.6 billion tons of sediment clog the river from degraded lands. The phenomenon is sufficiently strange that it even attracts tourists. But for the millions of people living in the Yellow River Basin, the sedimentation is more a source of fear than curiosity. What started as a tiny trickle when settled agriculture began, over time increased until it became a raging torrent. Over 1,500 times in recorded Chinese history, the Yellow River has breached its banks, flooding the plain and leaving destruction and suffering in its wake. When the river flooded in the rainy season, without normal infiltration, it often meant that there was drought in the rest of the year. And with drought came famine. This cycle of flooding, drought, and famine on the Lys Plateau became well known as China's sorrow. In order to address these problems, a team of Chinese and foreign experts was assembled in the mid-1990s to design and implement the Lus Plateau Watershed Rehabilitation Project. Now, when we came to this place in the Lois Plateau the first time, we were all really shocked. You know, we thought, oh my God, you know, well, how can, how can ever anybody try to rehabilitate an area that is so huge and so fundamentally destroyed ecologically. And the truth is we spent two years working with the local people, with the farmers, with the local officials, with the, with the experts in the various fields of hydrology, soil and water conservation, forestry, agriculture, environment, try to understand what it would take to do something like this. And after two years, we still didn't have many answers. The World Bank didn't have the answer and the local people didn't have the answer. And we spent another year and a half talking to the farmers in the villages, trying to understand what they had done in the past 20 or 30 years that was successful. And it was really interesting, not much was there to show because the current practices at that time were just not sustainable at all. Perhaps the most destructive practice was the unrestricted herding of goats and sheep. For decades and centuries, this area has been heavily grazed by sheep and goats. There was no management structure. People just went out, increased their animal numbers and gra grazed whatever grass they could find and whenever they could, wanted to do it. And it, kept, it got to a point, in the beginning, this was not a big issue because there is a lot of area around. But at, by the time the population density was high and the animal numbers were so large, all of a sudden you had this turning point where the, the vegetation began to disappear. Even if you graze hard in the beginning, it doesn't mean the vegetation disappears. But if you overdo it, all of a sudden you begin to really lose it. You lose the vegetation because the goats get to the point where they pull the grass out with its roots. And in many of the project areas, the vegetation cover was down to 10%. Well, previously this was a forest, natural grassland, in a completely intact ecosystem. 